All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ansible today. And um, before I tell you a little bit about myself, the reason for this title, DevOps for Humans, um, is mostly because I, I think that a lot of the world of DevOps has been about automation and machines and, and uh, getting into it from a perspective of a lot of heavy code. Um, but a lot of the emphasis hasn't been as much on uh, using DevOps in a human context, getting deployments done, getting everybody involved from end to end. So that's why I chose this title. Also, someone stated a couple days ago, the longer the title is and the more exclamation points and things like that, uh, the more people come to the session. So I think it worked. Uh, so I'm Jeff Gearling. Uh, you might have seen me as Gearling Guy on Drupal.org. Drupal uh, I've been in the Drupal community doing stuff since 2005. Uh, started with Drupal 4.7, have done sites with pretty much every point released between. Um, and uh, right now I'm working with Mercy. It's a healthcare system in St. Louis. I also own Midwestern Mac LLC, which uh, manages hosted Apache Solar and server check-in. So um, between all those different things, I'm managing uh, personally like 30 or 40 servers. And then through Mercy, I work with teams that have uh, projects across many hundreds of servers. So. Uh, I get a lot of work with infrastructure, and so uh, this presentation is kind of a, a growth from that. Um, I'm also writing a book right now called Ansible for DevOps, uh, and a lot of people seem to immediately be uh, put off by the word DevOp. They think I'm meaning DevOp, and DevOps is a plural, but that's not what I mean. DevOps is the word I'm talking about, Ansible, and the whole DevOps movement, which I'll talk about a tiny bit. Uh, right now it's 50% complete, but you can buy it now and you'll get updates forever. So go ahead and buy that, please. Um, in this presentation, I'm just going to go through three basic things. Uh, first of all, talk about Drupal deployments. Uh, Drupal especially can be a lot harder than some other kinds of applications that you might be deploying. Um, talk about how Ansible is not hard. It's simple, but it's also still powerful. And then, of course, why Ansible is good for Drupal deployments. Um, also, before we get started, I wanted to know a little bit about you people in the audience. Uh, how many of you are developers? Raise your hand. Okay. How many would call yourself a sysadmin? You don't do much development, mostly sysadmin work. Okay. And then how many servers does your project use? Is it, uh, how many people don't really manage servers at all? Okay. How many have 0 to 10? Okay. 10 to 100? Okay. More than 100? All right. A couple people. Good. All right, so um, let's get started. Uh, before we can get into Ansible, I want to stress some of the pain points we have. In the beginning, uh, and still this is the case in some places too, so don't, wanna, don't want to exclude people, uh, development was done locally uh, through MAMP or WAMP or something like that. Basically, every developer had his own machine. He set it up however he wanted, uh, got things going. And then once he was done with it, you'd put it in your repository, and then your deployment would be somebody doing a git pull, uh, doing some drush commands, and then also maybe 15 or 20 other steps. Eventually, you have a finished deploy, but uh, a lot of manual process there. Uh, servers would be set up either with some shell scripts or something, but it would be a big manual process. You order a new server, or you uh, provision a new server, and it might be a few hours, a few days, in some cases a few weeks or months. I have experience with that. Um, but basically, the, the principle is a lot of things were manual, heavily manual, so we wanted to get through that. Uh, and what would happen with a lot of deployments is basically this. That's your beautiful Drupal site that was ready to go out. <laughs> Launch it, and it gets destroyed by the process. So um, this is something that uh, this still happens. For some of you who are fully automated already, I don't know why you're in this session, but for some of you, this might not be the case. But for a lot of people, uh, there's a big fight uh, between the developers, the project teams, and the admins who get things done on the servers. Uh, and then the problem is that, that back in those old days, and still, again, for some sites, server setups were like this. There was a big server with LAMP, basically. This is how things were back when Drupal was created. That's Dries for people who don't know back in his college days. Uh, he didn't have the big hair at that point. Um, but it was one server, not too hard to manage. 
it was still annoying to have to do some manual things, but you'd have a big, huge Snowflake server that was beautiful and unique, but also hard to maintain and hard to recreate if you ever had to. This is a bit more what uh, current modern Drupal deployments, especially for bigger sites, looks like. Your site might have more or less of these parts, but often there's more than one server involved, and there might be some load balancers, and there might be some other parts of the infrastructure that are uh, only controllable through APIs and things like that, if you're on Amazon or uh, DigitalOcean or Linode or something. So uh, that's bad, but then when you think about it, a lot of places have four environments that are exactly the same with tons of servers. So you're not talking about one server or two servers. You're talking about 50, 100, 200 servers that you're managing, and there's no way that you can do a manual process and have good uptime and have good deployments all the time. And that's where we are today. Um, and in the future, things could get even more hairy when you have containers, thousands of containers running on hundreds of servers, but you don't even think about the servers anymore. So we need things to help us um, get through the situation without us wanting to uh, kill ourselves. So DevOps, as I said earlier, I don't mean a person. I mean a movement, a idea. Um, there's a lot of argument over the word, but, but basically to me it's, it's a holistic view of development and operations. It's all one and the same. There are still sysadmins and there are still developers. A developer is not going to be the guy who's doing all the gritty server work. You know, if you manage your own service, he's not racking up servers. But you can work together more. Um, there can be silos, but the silos can work together instead of being brick walls. Uh, so, so three things that we want to fix nowadays is we want to make sure that when we have tons of servers, it's not just LAMP. It's Linux and Apache and Linux and MySQL, Linux and PHP, or whatever kinds of applications you're using. You want to manage those easily. You want to be able to, be able to scale up quickly. So if you're using a cloud service and you have a, an infrastructure where you might be having a million visits in an hour one day and then the rest of the week very little, you don't want to be paying for some huge server or a ton of small servers that whole time. So you want to be able to scale up and scale down automatically without you having to do a lot of manual work. And then finally, we want to have testable infrastructure. And this is big um, in the software development community. Uh, Test-driven development or at least well-tested development is a big important part of our process and uh, in the infrastructure world this is just beginning to catch on. We want to be able to test our infrastructure just like we test our code so that we know when there's a deployment the failures are not going to be because of our infrastructure. The only thing it could be is lightning or earthquakes, things like that that are completely out of our control. We can't test for that. We might be able to if you had Google's money. So one principle that I think is uh, that kind of sums up the, a lot of what the tooling around the DevOps movement would be is that it would take less time to rebuild a server from scratch than to log in and fix it. So a lot of people aren't to that point yet. Right now, um, I know a lot of places that I've worked with, if our server goes down, it's going to be everybody gets on call, you're wasting 45 people's time, uh, you're wasting tons of money, and your site's down for a while. And then eventually, 30 minutes later, somebody logs into the server and reboots a service or something. But if a server goes down or if some service goes down, you should be able to have another server up in a minute or less, I would say. So that's one principle. I'm going to take it a step further and uh, reuse this classic Drupal meme. Uh, every time you log into a prod server, God kills a kitten. So please, please don't kill the kittens. Um, this, this was a slide from, I think, five years ago, 2007, 8, I don't remember when it was. Um, and it said, every time you hack core, God kills a kitten. So in my mind, uh, if it's not this way now, it will be within five or ten years. Logging into a production server is not going to be a normal thing to do uh, for deployment, for a fix, for anything. So what do we have available on the market today? Uh, Puppet came out in 2005. I know a lot of people use it. It's a very good product, very reliable. Uh, one thing I don't particularly like about it, but it's not a big issue, is that it uses a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, that's kind of based on Ruby. So you have to learn a new kind of configuration language. You have to learn a different kind of template language. Um, you have to install something on every single server you manage, which is a little bit annoying. There are ways with Puppet and Chef to do it differently. Uh, but it's hard. And no matter what, you're going to have to do something on every server you manage, whether it's automatic or not. Uh, and also, there's no simple, easy, built-in way to do 
something like reboot all your servers. Uh, you still have to use some other tool to do something like that. Chef was built in 2009. It, uh, it has a little bit more standardized Ruby-ish syntax, uh, but it, in my mind, a lot of the ways it does things are basically the same as Puppet, just a little different here and there. Uh, so I usually group Puppet and Chef in the same thing. They're, they're both great products. They both do a lot of great work, and they both have a lot of tooling around them. Uh, Salt came out in 2011, and like Ansible, it changed a few things. First of all, it doesn't use some language, some programming language or some domain-specific language to do the configuration. It uses YAML, which is a language that was built for configuration and readability, so it's easier to manage your configuration that way. It uses Jinja 2 for s templates, which is a templating language. It's built for making templates. It's not built for programming. And uh, Jinja 2 is exactly like Twig. In fact, the author of Jinja 2 is the same guy who worked on Twig. So one takeaway from this is if you are learning YAML and Jinja 2 for uh, Ansible, you are actually learning YAML and Twig for Drupal 8. So there's transferable skills there. Nice selling point. Um, but Salt, as with the other ones, is requires something to be installed on all the servers. There's a way, again, to run it in a different mode, but that's not the default, and it's a little harder, a little trickier. Uh, but Salt also introduces a simple way to execute tasks across your servers, so run a command on your servers or call something on your servers. So that's another improvement. Ansible came out in 2012 uh, and has some more... Uh, it, it also includes the ability to manage your servers through SSH. Uh, and that's pretty big. Um, instead of having to install extra software that's running on each of your servers to do certain things, you can have Ansible go through SSH, manage everything, and everybody has SSH on their servers running right now. Um, and uh, it has all the other nice features that Salt does. And it has the most stars on GitHub. So, But as I say down at the bottom, that doesn't mean much. It's just a reference point. Now, a lot of times people, especially if you are, uh, I think a lot of developers and admins are very much into my tool is the best tool. But in the Ansible community, it's not about Ansible as a replacement for X or Ansible is better than X. It is, but uh, we're about hug ops. We like Chef. We like Puppet. Uh, we know their heritage. CF Engine 2, I have to throw that in there even though I've never used it. Um, and the cool thing about Ansible is you can use it for what you need or what you want to, and it still works great with your existing infrastructure, your existing tooling, you could use Ansible to coordinate the deployment and run some, uh, some Puppet or Chef things and set things up through Ansible to continue using whatever you're using now. Or if you, want, if you have a team that already knows something else, you can throw Ansible in, and it's easy to pick up and learn to do simple parts. Um, so we're not against anybody in using Ansible. So these are just a few companies that use Ansible. Um, you might have heard of some of them. It's had a lot of uh, big adoption. There was uh, the first Ansible Fest was this year in New York City. Uh, some, there were some great presentations there. A lot of them recorded. The slides are all available, you can see. Uh, they're doing some neat things at Twitter and uh, NASA and, and other places that are using it. I think Rackspace is getting into Ansible in a big way. They actually have some sort of fork or, uh, that's like Ansible, but built for Rackspace, basically. Um, and I'm also using it for the things that I do. That's why I'm giving this presentation. Um, so let's get started. Um, it's been 15 minutes, but we can start getting into it. And by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to automate everything with Ansible, I guarantee. Uh, so Ansible needs a way to describe your infrastructure. Uh, and it's pretty simple. If you've ever edited a host's file, it's practically the same. You just give it a list of hosts, and with Ansible, you can also give it a list of variables. So this is a basic inventory file. It can be even more basic than this, but I'm going to show you a little bit about how this is more flexible. Uh, first, you give a group name. So this could be a group of like web servers or database servers. For, in our instance, we're just going to call it LAMP. And then uh, you give it a list of hosts. In our example, we're just giving one. And some variables to use with that host. And these can be, you can put in any kind of variable that you want to use in your playbook later that I'll talk about. But for this, in this case, a lot of times you'll be wanting to use a user that's not your current username and or a port or some other kinds of settings. And uh, 
let's see. And this, this file, the inventory file, by default would be in uh, Etsy, Ansible, Hosts. So everything would be uh, configured in that directory, but you can also do things to put inventories other places. And then after you've described your infrastructure, you need to tell Ansible what do you want to do with it. Uh, so you have playbook tasks. That is the, that's like the smallest module of code that you can do in Ansible, uh, not code configuration. And this is YAML, so you have documentation built in. You don't have to have the documentation, but it sure helps when you have 300 tasks and you're trying to figure out the one that failed. It just has a bunch of descriptions instead of your actual documentation. Then you have a module, and Ansible right now has 268 different built-in modules uh, that do anything from configure packages to interact with uh, load balancers to do pretty much anything. And you can extend and add your own modules using PHP or um, uh, Ruby or whatever language you want as long as it outputs JSON. And then you have some arguments to that module to tell it what to do. So in this case, we're making sure Apache is installed. We're using apt or if you're on CentOS or Red Hat, you can use yum. Giving it a package name and saying the state, we want the latest version of it. You could also just say installed and it would install whatever version it is or just leave it if it's already installed. And then here's a little bit more realistic playbook. Um, so in this case, in the example we're gonna have here, we're gonna save this playbook as web.yaml. And first we are, I don't have my thing, let me grab my, pointer so I can point this out. So first we have the uh, documentation. We're making sure that Apache and PHP is installed. Next, we're using apt again. Uh, and then for package, we're actually giving a variable. For anybody that's used twig at all in Drupal 8, you'll notice that this looks just like that, the two uh, curly brackets. This is a variable. And we're telling it, use these items here with items. And it will run through and do each, it'll do this command each time with one of these. Uh, and then again, we're using state latest because we want the latest version. Uh, the second task is just making sure that Apache started. So there's a service module that uses the service command uh, and it's platform agnostic, so it works with whatever kind of Linux distro you're using. And we want to make sure that Apache 2 is started. So that's web.yaml. And then we need a playbook to run that file that we just saved. We could do this all in one playbook, but I'll show you why that's not uh, desirable later. Um, so this is kind of our orchestration playbook. Uh, we're telling it first uh, the host that we want to run this on. So we defined in our inventory LAMP, and now we want to run this playbook on all of our LAMP servers. Uh, and then we're also telling it here uh, that we want to use sudo because uh, we're going to log in as our uh, non-administrative account and use so, sudo to do the actions instead of logging in as root. And then uh, at the bottom here, we're including that web.yaml file that we just created. So we want to run this playbook and get our server set up how we want it. And it looks something like this. And once it's finished, it gives you a little recap that shows how many servers did it do things on, how many servers was everything fine, already matched your configuration. Uh, pretty quick and easy. I'll go into the Ansible playbook command a little bit more later. Uh, but for now, I want to also say that uh, these, all the commands I'm running today are running through Vagrant on my local host. Um, and Ansible works perfectly fine and easily with Vagrant. And an advantage to that is you can test all of your infrastructure, including many server infrastructures, on your local computer using Vagrant very easily. Um, and to do that, all you do is define, define a provisioner, give it a playbook, and give it an inventory file. Uh, or if you don't get an inventory file, you use the one at uh, Etsy hosts or Etsy Ansible hosts. So let's get past just a basic Apache and PHP installation and get to Drupal 8. So this playbook here, uh, we start off and we're using a new set of hosts, the D8 hosts. Uh, we're again using sudo, and then we're gonna make sure our apt uh, repositories are updated. And for Drupal 8, it requires PHP 5.4 or later, so uh, we're going to install Andrej, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the, the, uh, an extra repository to get that. In this case, we're gonna run it on an Ubuntu 12.02 host. And then 
uh, down here, I'll talk a little bit more about roles, but basically, these are sets of playbooks. That's what we'll think about right now. And yes, this actually works. This one playbook right here will install everything you need in about three minutes and 14 seconds uh, on a decent internet connection. And in the end, you end up with a fully installed Drupal website. Um, and let me give you a quick demo of that before we get into roles. So, so here's our Drupal site that we just installed. And uh, this is Drupal 8 head, was installed with Drush head. Uh, and it all works fine. And what happens, uh, I ran the playbook, it had like 60 or 70 tasks, it ran all the tasks, got everything installed, and then if we run it again now, and this is live on my Mac. <clears throat> so it gets through everything, and at the end of it, it tells you, I didn't change anything. Uh, that's a nice feature of Ansible. You can either run it as a straight up script or run it with dash dash check, and it'll give a report what is your current configuration? Is there anything that's changed from what you described? Uh, so when you're debugging something, you can run it with dash dash check, see what's going on. Um, or if you have a script or some sort of um, monitoring on your servers, you can just run Ansible playbooks with check mode and then make sure that they're in the state that they need to be in and alert you if they're not. So let me pop back in here. So Ansible roles, you notice that I showed you there were a few things prefixed with Gearling Guide, dot, whatever. Um, those are roles that I got off of Ansible Galaxy. Uh, but your roles can be named anything you want. <laughs> Basically, it's a way to put together a set of configuration variables and things like that all in one little package uh, for different kinds of things. Now, in my case, I was using like Gearling Guide, dot, PHP and MySQL, so basically like a package to a role. But you can do it any way you want. You could have a role called web server setup or a role called uh, Nginx PHP or something and do different things in it. Uh, but it's a way to put together things into one small package in a reusable way. So um, an Ansible role can have a few different parts to it. Um, in, in most of the cases with the roles that were being run there, most of these were used. So tasks would be the, the web.yaml file. It would be th things to do on a host, the configuration to run on a host. Handlers are things that are called, if you have a certain task that needs to restart Apache, you'd put a handler, which is just a task, but in the handlers folder, called restart Apache, and it would restart Apache. Um, and then vars is variables, and you can also have default variables. Uh, variables are very flexible and Ansible, so you can use one role and use it across your entire infrastructure for different kinds of servers. Templates would be Jinja files. Uh, that way you can uh, have configurations and things that are different across servers. Files would be just files to copy up to the server, but there's many different ways to do that besides just throwing them up on the server. And then meta describes information like dependencies, and if you're gonna contribute the rollback, uh, it will be on Ansible Galaxy, put some information in there. So we're gonna make a quick Drupal deployment role. We have our Drupal 8 site set up now, and we want to uh, deploy an update to it. So inside of a roles directory, or you can put roles wherever you want, you can configure it for your system, we're going to make a site-deploy role. And Ansible will pick this up as the folder name, basically. That's the role name. And then in this role, we're gonna have a tasks file. So this task is gonna run some Drush commands. Uh, a couple notes here. Ansible, the command module basically runs a command on the server, it's pretty simple. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna run a drush command. Um, and some, a note on YAML syntax formatting, this little uh, greater than sign basically tells the YAML parser everything on every other line after this, just add a space between it. So that'll be helpful uh, if you're doing Drupal 8 configuration too and you have something that takes a lot of lines, you can just throw that in there and have your multiple lines. Uh, so we're going to run a drush command with the items down here again. That's what this item does. And then we're also going to change the directory before we run the command. Uh, and we're using a variable here. I'll get to that in a second. Drupal core path. We want to be inside there to run these drush commands. 
and we're going to run CSET, which does um, a configuration setting change. And then wrap is the role add permission. And then at the end of it, we're going to notify a handler that I was talking about earlier called restart web server. And I call it web server because I want to make this role more flexible. It could be used with Nginx, it could be used with Lighty, it could be used with Apache, whatever you want. Um, and again, save this as tasks slash main.yaml. Ansible automatically picks up whatever main.yaml file is inside of a uh, folder inside your role. So next we have our, var our vars file. And we have a site name, which if we go back here, uh, you saw there was a variable site name right here. So this will be picked up and thrown in there by Ansible. And the role has this variable, but also any playbook that you have for any server could override these variables. And then we have a Drupal core path right here. And then finally we have our handlers. Like I was saying, when you do any of those drush commands, you want to restart the web server. In this case, we don't need to restart Apache necessarily. Uh, but if you had something like uh, reset something or flush a cache or whatever you want to do, add handlers and then call them with the tasks that need those things done. And then we're going to make sure that even if we didn't use sudo for our playbook, because you don't need to for some deployment steps, uh, we still want to have sudo used for restarting the web server. So we have those three files. We put them in the site deploy directory under tasks, vars, and handlers. And we want to make a playbook to use that role. And it's as simple as this. Uh, we just tell it what host to run the role on, and then we add the role in a list of roles. Save that as playbook.yaml. And let me pop, whoops. I want to delete that. So let me switch over here. So this is that uh, playbook that I just added. So it's running these drush commands and restarting the web server. And if I pop over here, you'll notice that the site name changed. And since everybody can search now, the anonymous user has a search block. So a couple notes on that. Let me get back to here. So a couple notes on this. One is uh, when you're running commands, obviously this is pretty contrived. Uh, most deployments aren't just running a drush command or two. Uh, there's a git module for Ansible. I'm not going to go into all the different parts that you can use. There's a git module. There's, um, there's a shell module if you need to use special variables and things inside of there. Um, plenty of modules to do all the things that you need to interact with. Uh, and your playbooks can be as long or as short as you want, but uh, one thing that I usually do with my roles is I'll have my main YAML file with the tasks, and it'll just include different sets of steps for that role. So if it were a Drush site install, uh, I'd have the Drupal core checkout using git. There'd be a git command. And then I'd have, um, I'd have a Drush install if I needed to install Drush with Composer. That would be in another included task file. And then I'd have the site install command through Drush and any permissions changes and folders and things like that, database setup. Um, so, and and you'd be surprised, Ansible has so many different modules. Almost anything that you're going to do on a server, even if it's third-party software, uh, there's modules already made up for it. Or if there aren't, there probably will be by the next time Ansible uh, updates to a point release. So let me pop back to our demo slide. Um, and there's another uh, nice thing that was just added in Ansible 1.5, I think, maybe. Yeah, it was 1.5. Uh, there are tons of notification modules built in. Uh, so whatever you're notifying, whether it's IRC or email or whatever, or if you're using some third-party services to do notifications and, um, and get into chat channels and whatever you need to do, uh, there's tons of different notification modules built in, like this one is IRC. And uh, it will, you just give it the parameters you need. And uh, in our case, we'd be adding another variable called IRC message. And Ansible has another option you can pass uh, called delegate to which tells it, run this command on localhost. Don't run it on the, uh, on the server that the playbook is running on. And so this is powerful not only for notifications, but for other things where you need to call some other service or you need to uh, do some other kind of task that you can do through your local computer, but you wouldn't want to do through your server, uh, especially if it requires extra software installed. Uh, you don't want to install junk on your server just to do some little API task or something like that. So you can delegate a task to whatever server. You can use tasks. You can put in a user 
uh, attribute and then tell it what user to run the task as. Um, so I'll give a quick demo of that too. Uh, oops, wrong window. Oops. So this is the same playbook but with that IRC task added. And if anybody is on the DrupalCon channel, you'll be able to see this message in just a second. And the reason why I did this separately was because if the network was having an issue, you guys won't uh, make me feel too bad. Uh, I know from running server check-in that the internet is a horrible, horrible place if you're considering uh, doing presentations or considering uptime. So anyway, it did it, and uh, anybody that uh, might have been on the channel might have seen it. Was any okay? Somebody saw it. Good. All right, so let's pop back in. All right, so so once we have our site deployment set up, uh, a lot of people will do a deployment completely separate from their operations of provisioning servers and setting up things. In Ansible, the principle really is you have all of your configuration and all your deployment, everything packaged up in one big package, but it's all in small chunks. So you could take out a site deployment and just do a deploy using a separate playbook. Or in our case, we can have uh, we can throw this role in with the whole server provisioning. So when you provision a new server, it deploys the site. There's no separate step. Um, it's all together. And uh, this is the same exact uh, playbook that we had earlier, just with site deploy added in. So now, when we have a, a cluster of servers like this, which is the modern way of doing things, uh, we have playbooks for each one of the sets of things. So we'd have a playbook to set up the web server and deploy Drupal to it. We'd have a playbook for the caching servers and setting up all their fire, firewall rules and everything. Playbook for search servers and database servers, everything. And then on top of that, we'd have one playbook to do a full deployment across everything. And uh, this playbook can do things like pull three or four servers out of a load balancer, do the stuff on them, put them back in, pull the next three out, do some stuff. It's pretty easy to configure with Ansible. Don't have time to cover it today, unfortunately. Uh, but once you, once you granularize your infrastructure like this using a bunch of simple YAML files in Ansible, it's easy to do uh, whatever you need to with your infrastructure and with your deployments. And instead of having a ton of uh, setup work for new servers or your entire infrastructure, you just put a new server in a pool, and Ansible picks it up, and Ansible does whatever it needs to to it while you're deploying everything else. So what this would look like is uh, this would be that master uh, YAML file doing everything. Uh, you'd, the, the first one up here, the first uh, set of tests is the, uh, for all, it will just do it on every server in your, in your inventory. So you could use a custom inventory or you want to be careful when you use this if you're using it with a global inventory because it will literally run this on every server that you've ever managed in your inventory. So, um, But anyway, so the, it would maybe install some security software, monitoring, uh, file share, users, whatever kind of stuff you need on all your servers. Then you have your web servers using whatever roles it needs for those. And then database server. Um, so this way you have a role for every kind of setup task that you have. And then you have a... Uh, a set of hosts in your inventory file that defines what servers to run it on, and then you just throw the roles on those servers. So uh, I think with Ansible, it took me about an hour or two to get started uh, and have my first task being run on remote servers since it all uses SSH. If you can connect to your server through SSH, you can set up some tasks, run it with Ansible Playbook, It'll kick them off to the server. You're done. Um, and even if you're just trying to confirm a configuration, use the service module, say, make sure this is started, make sure this is enabled at boot, that kind of stuff. You can do that in a, maybe five, ten minutes if you already are familiar with Linux administration. Um, and it's just YAML, so you don't have to learn some new syntax that's hard to use. Uh, it also solves problems uh, that we have in our, uh, in our world where there's solid silos and walls between development and operations. Uh, there's no more excuse for uh, having a developer have everything working perfectly because he spent three and a half hours working on some tweaking some config files and then he puts it on prod and it all falls apart. 
Uh, it also helps with sysadmins not getting burnt out, not wanting that alcohol anymore. Instead, they can have family time. Probably still want the alcohol, though. And for me, I know, and hopefully for a lot of you, if you get into it, um, you'll actually start enjoying the automation. Uh, because when you're using YAML, when you're using Ansible, when you have your host described in that inventory, instead of spending time wrestling with syntax and wrestling with the way that things are interacting and why is the server not responding, oh, the thing just shut down on it, the daemon's not running anymore, uh, you just focus on getting your servers set up and running. And everything is done through SSH, so it's not hard to get set up, it's not hard to keep it running, and it's fun to be able to iterate so quickly. Uh, but also, beware of the golden hammer. Just like with Drupal, Ansible is not suited for everything. I've seen people go off the deep end and start using Ansible to do builds and do um, things that are not suited to a, conf a more of a configuration management system. Uh, Ansible is not a configuration management system. It's great at it, uh, but it's actually an infrastructure management system. It's good for helping with deployments and things like that. Uh, but if you're doing things where Jenkins would be a f better fit, do Jenkins, and then use Ansible to do some stuff on the server itself. Uh, there's a lot, a whole lot, that I wanted to cover today, um, but I wanted to open it up for questions a little earlier because I know there's enough variety in this audience that you guys probably have better questions than what I could think of up here. Uh, so I wanted to cover some things like Ansible and Packer. Uh, for setting up things like AMIs in Amazon or images in DigitalOcean, uh, images for VirtualBox. One cool thing that we have going on where I'm working now is I have one uh, Ansible playbook that has like 15 roles or something. And we use that same playbook to set up a VirtualBox, and I can use it, we don't yet, but I can use it to make a VMware image and basically have the same Ansible stuff set up to make a pre-made pre box to put onto Amazon or your local host or wherever you need to to run your entire application within a few seconds of startup instead of um, having to install Linux and then run Ansible on it, and that takes like seven minutes, and who has seven minutes? Um, <laughs> Ansible also works very well with Docker. Uh, I know some people see Docker and they say, oh, I don't have to do any of that system administration stuff. It's like, no, you still have to do a lot of that with Docker. And Ansible can help. It helps you get things set up, and it helps you uh, move around Docker containers. Um, and Ansible works great with Docker. I, there's some integration already, and it's being improved every day as Docker's being, getting closer to a 1.0 release. I think um, I personally have done very little with Docker, but from what I've done, I see the power, and I think that that's where things are moving towards. So tool like Ansible will evolve with it and become uh, key in infrastructures that are based on containers. Ansible also has deep integration with Amazon, DigitalOcean, Linode, Rackspace, pretty much any cloud provider, including uh, ones that are self-hosted. Ansible already has modules that will provision servers, will use dynamic inventory so you're not sitting there defining servers, but it will call an API, grab the list of servers out of it, put them into groups and things, and then you'll be able to um, have the servers provisioned automatically, helping with your auto-scaling. Uh, and then, even if you're not doing auto-scaling, if you just want to set up a new server, it's nice to have dynamic inventory, so you can just, uh, through Ansible, add a server in your variable file, and then it will provision it, set it up, get it in your load balance, do whatever it needs to. Uh, and also, there's at least five, 600 things that I couldn't cover today, and I couldn't cover if I had a full day. and. Uh, um, even at Ansible Fest, they couldn't cover about more than like 10% of this. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot that Ansible has out of the box already, and a lot of cool stuff that's in the works, um, to the point where I have not had a situation yet where I have not been able to do something inside of Ansible uh, that I've needed to do in my infrastructure. And I have to say, once I got up and running, once I got everything in my inventory for server check-in, I have not logged into one of my server check-in servers for three or four months now. Um, I don't need to, and it's very easy uh, to get everything going, especially if you have simpler servers, simpler services, or infrastructure that has, um, you know, different applications on different servers. So there's a ton of resources out there besides this talk. Uh, there's great documentation. I think in the Drupal community, we have amazing documentation. But if you go out and read the Ansible docs, you might be ashamed. Uh, they have really well-written documentation 
good example for our community to pick up. Most of their documentation starts with a guide of how to do something, and then it gives you all the details about here's the different things, here's the different modules you can use. Uh, but it's all organized really well, searchable, uh, very easy to read, and uh, there's already over, I think, 700 different people that have contributed to the documentation, but it looks like it was written by one person, so they're doing a great job. Uh, they have a very vibrant IRC channel, Ansible. There's usually seven to 800 people in there, and that's been rising every month. So if you ever have any question, no matter how ridiculous, you'll probably have an answer within a few minutes. Um, I've had some interesting questions, and it's like nobody's going to answer this. And then somebody has the exact question or the exact answer in a gist somewhere. They just post it to me, and then I know. Uh, there's also a Google group mailing list. Uh, there's one for the Ansible project if you want to get involved with it. There's also one for um, the development, so if you're helping develop uh, in Python uh, or if you're just helping with docs or things like that. Of course, my book, which is being written as we speak uh, and has taken a short hiatus in preparation for this uh, presentation, um, but it's being, being written. I hope to uh, be able to take somebody who's used to either basic puppet and chef or shell scripting or even manual provisioning uh, and take you from there to fully managing your infrastructure through Ansible, uh, probably by chapter three or four. So um, finally, there's Ansible Weekly, which is a really good newsletter uh, that has some great articles, great videos, uh, great discussions. Um, and that is, uh, that comes out every Friday. I think one just came out today. So sign up for that if you're interested. And I have three takeaways. One is please go download Ansible. It's really easy to install, especially if you have a Mac or Linux. If you have Windows, teeny tiny bit harder, but it's more motivation to switch to Mac. Uh, <laughs> then after that, uh, go ahead and take a server that you have and write one task for it. Run that task using the Ansible playbook command. It's not very hard at all. I think for most people in this room, we could probably get it done in 10 to 20 minutes from the time that you install Ansible. Uh, and that's powerful. You don't have to do extra steps. I know the first time I started using Puppet, it took me three or four hours before I was running anything on a server. And that was with a fresh, brand new server. Um, now, it's, you know, it might be quicker if you know what you're doing, but that was the first time I'd ever started reading Puppet docs. And it's powerful to be able to pick something up and start running with it right away. Um, so, and then finally, buy my book, please. So um, I want to open it up for questions. I, I basically covered the basics of here's a playbook, here's what you do, run it, and uh, how to describe your infrastructure. But I know a lot of people here have different questions. I've, since writing this book, I've been getting so many different kinds of awesome questions that have helped me and them. So go ahead. <laughs> So um, I, I bought the book. Thanks. Um, I was uh, I, I was aware of Ansible, but I was always thinking of Ansible in the, as uh, uh, as strictly in the in the server config space. So we're using Chef, and mm -hmm. uh, my friends are using Ansible. So I figured it was just a matter of time. But um, when I, you showed us here. Um, Wrapping up a uh, Drush site install in Ansible. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really server config anymore. We're talking about actually build automation. Yes. And so we do build automation in Thing mm -hmm. right now. Um, yeah. Can I can I think about like um, rewriting our Thing in Ansible? And we're going to find limitations in terms of like the flex. More is there more flexibility in Thing in terms of doing the stuff? Or? Yes, that's a very good question, and that comes in with the uh, don't use it as a golden hammer. Ansible is. <laughs> It, it, you could do everything you can do in Thing in Ansible, but Thing is actually really good for PHP deployment. So uh, we still use Thing where I work um, for parts of it, and we use Ansible for other parts of it. Usually more of the server config goes into Ansible, and more of the PHP stuff uh, doing different Drush interaction goes into Thing. Um, but I, I would say try it out. See, see which things are better suited to Ansible, because Thing is... It feels very Java-like to me, uh, and Ansible feels more Drupal-like, where it's like, get it done uh, in the simplest way possible. So Fing has some really nice features, and uh, but it can be verbose, and it can be a little bit obtuse, I think. So 
things that are better suited to Fing, keep them in Fing. And especially if you have it working, leave it in Fing. Just use Ansible yeah. to call Fing. That's it. You know? Yeah, verbose and obtuse do, do seem appropriate for that. But <laughs> yeah. it works. Yeah, it's good yeah, stuff. No, it's, it's great. It's great. And Ansible is not made to be a build system or anything like that. So yeah. I wouldn't consider it using it uh, to replace Fing by any means. But some parts of Fing I would. But aw awesome. This was a really, really valuable presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So Ansible seems pretty awesome. Um, small disclaimer, I do work for Xspace, but hey, we're awesome too. Um, <laughs> so I've, I'm more familiar with Puppet, and one of the Puppet's big things is getting away from SSH in a for loop mm -hmm. and add impotency and things like that. Um, how does Ansible deal with that? Because if you're just writing like shell scripts and things like that, are the modules that Ansible creates idempotent? Yes, I, I actually, since I didn't, since I had this on the mirroring, I didn't have my presenter note to mention that because every time I practice this presentation, I forget to talk about idempotence. Idempotence is when you do something twice. It's a mathematical concept. If you run a function twice, it does the exact same thing every time. If you run it 500 times, same result. So uh, with Ansible and with Puppet and Chef and pretty much every configuration management system, the idea is you give it a final state, and then you run it, and then what should end up happening is your server is in that state at the end of it. And then if you run it again, it's still in that state. So you could run it continuously and never have an issue. So Ansible, every module built into Ansible is idempotent by default. Uh, so that service module, and, and when, I, when I ran that uh, demo the second time, it, it ran through and said, OK, 56, or whatever it was, and it changed equals 0. So every time you run it, it'll be the same result, and it'll tell you if anything changed. Um, and Ansible uses SSH as a transport. It doesn't run commands through SSH. So I, I know so I, when... Uh, one time I saw an admin doing a deployment where he had eight terminal windows open, and he had some little utility that would chain, put his command over eight terminal windows. Now, I'm younger, so I don't know why that is so enticing, but I guess in the old days, you know, or nowadays, um, doing that was powerful. But Ansible doesn't do that. It doesn't just like log into eight servers and then do one on one on one. It, uh, it transports... It takes the module, the task that you build, puts it into a small Python module, sends it to the server through SSH, and then it runs it on the server. Then the server reports back through JSON to Ansible, uh, good or bad or whatever. Uh, so that's powerful because you can write modules in any language you want. So you can use PHP to make Ansible modules. All it has to do is report back some JSON, like here's the error or here's the success, uh, did it change or not. And that it's very simple, to, the API for it. Um, if you're going to contribute it to Ansible core, you have to write it in Python, uh, but Python's not too difficult. So uh, just delete all your uh, delete all your semicolons, and you'll be fine. Wait, is that Python or I'm confusing? That's yeah. Python uh, and brackets. Yes. And yeah. So so anyway, um, and then you had did you have another question about that? Uh, slightly related. Um, since I started working on Rackspace, I was introduced to Ansible, um, and Ransack is the tool that we're using internally. That's it, yeah. um, it's, it's really neat to see that Ransack uses the Ansible API as well as the Rackspace API to see, like, gather information about customers. And Ansible can also interact with the Rackspace API for customers um, on your end, and we can help you, you know, manage your servers through Ansible. Um, had a question there, but I forgot it, so I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, no, it, Rackspace had a couple really good presentations at Ansible Fest. Uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to go there. Uh, the slides are somewhere online. I don't remember exactly where. Just search Ansible Fest Rackspace, you'll find it. Uh, I want to applaud you for your use of Postgre and Nginx. I don't think enough people use yeah. a very solid software foundation, much better than Apache and MySQL. <laughs> uh, but anyway, my question actually is, one, um, can Ansible deploy through an SSH proxy? I'm not too sure, but I would presume... I is it using just SSH protocol, basically? Yeah, you can write an SSH command. So, like, everything we do, there's a proxy server in the middle mm -hmm. yeah, that we it, have to go through first. It, it should be able to. I have not had to deal with that, so don't take my word on it. But if you have a problem with it, 
pop on Ansible's IRC channel, ask about it. I would presume it could. Um, as long as as long as it follows SSH's protocol, you're going to be fine. Um, and there, there's also different, like, if you have some older servers, too, I forgot to mention, uh, Ansible interacts with SSH in different modes, and it auto-detects what kind of mode it needs to use for your servers. If you have really ancient Red Hat 5 servers, uh, then it will switch down to a slower uh, old-school mode. Uh, but if you have most modern servers, uh, it'll use control persist and some other uh, little tricks to make the connections a lot quicker, and it'll save one connection. Even though it's connecting a ton of times, it'll use the one connection for all your commands, so it's not making a ton of network connections either. Uh, the other question I have is, can Ansible do any form of, like, monitoring? So, like, watch for something to change and then do something in response yes. to that? Yes, yeah, and that was... I think it might have been in that list way down. It, there's there's a few different ways. One is there's wait for, wait underscore for, and you can wait for a time limit, so wait 60 seconds for something to restart. If you ever work with Java applications, a lot of them are so sluggishly starting up. Um, you can wait for that way. You can also wait for a port to be available. So, like, let's say you're restarting the SSH daemon. Um, you can wait until port 22 is available again. Then it's like, okay, now I know. Then you can continue on. Um, and you can also register variables. So, like, if you run a drush command, you can register a variable with the command's output and check the output, and if the output has a certain word, do something else, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different ways to interact with the results of some other command. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. This was a, a great summary of uh, Ansible. I've spent about an afternoon worth of time with Ansible and also with SaltStack. And mm -hmm. based on my experience and also your description of them, it's hard to see much difference, especially since SaltStack yeah. can run in agentless mode. Yes. So I'm wondering how much time you've spent with SaltStack to decide that you prefer Ansible, if you have any other comments on the, the differences. I spent When I first found out about Ansible, I, um, I was looking into what's better than Puppet or Chef at that point, and I found Salt at that time. So I, I tried them both out, and at that point, Salt, salt required the uh, uh, 0MQ, or is that what it's requiring? Yeah. So it required that running on the server at that point. So my, my, uh, my thinking was kind of soured by that taste. Um, but now Salt is... If I were starting now, it would be a hard decision between Salt and Ansible because Salt is actually slightly faster for some things. Um, but to my eye, what I've seen so far, it seems like Ansible has a little bit more community, a little bit more, um, more widespread support in terms of if I want to do something, Ansible already has something to do that, uh, whereas Salt has been slightly less uh, like that for me. But if you're using Salt, I say go for it because it, I, I think there's space uh, for more than one. As we know, Puppet and Chef have been existing since 2005 and nine, and they're still going strong. So, um, But I personally enjoy using Ansible a lot. Salt is very much the same. Sure. Um, one more quick question, if I can. It seems like uh, the uh, Ansible actions uh, run synchronously. Is there an option to designate certain tasks to be run asynchronously? In a way, yes. Um, if you have a playbook, you can you can have you can set how many servers at a time it wants to run the command on. So that's one way that you can have if you have a ton of servers. Yeah, I'm thinking more it's, about yeah, on but commands for, on one particular for tasks server. in particular. Uh, there are ways to do that, but it's not the norm in Ansible. Uh, normally, Ansible set up to do a list, so you start at one and end at ten. Uh, because a lot of the things that Ansible does are dependent on the Previous task completion. Sure. So uh, it's, that's not the norm for Ansible. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So back to me. Um, if uh, You say that uh, Ansible is not really a configuration management, but it does a lot for templating and things like that. Um, if I already have a Puppet infrastructure set up and I already have my machine set up to be at the end state, mm -hmm. where does Ansible fit into there? So in that kind of situation, A, you don't need to start using Ansible right away or anything like that. Yeah, you might never use Ansible. But if you want to start using it, Ansible can help you with uh, in tandem with maybe Jenkins or something to do deployments to that infrastructure where you are uh, taking servers out of a load balancer, running something on it, uh, you know, installing an update to Drupal or whatever, and then taking them back into the load balancer. That kind of stuff is where Ansible really shines and is simple, uh, as opposed to some other tools like um, 
Has anybody here used Funk or Capistrano or something like that? Okay, so a few people have. Yeah, so so those tools are built just for that, but Ansible can do that stuff too. And it's the the nicest thing is if you have your infrastructure described in a way that Ansible can pick it up, either using dynamic inventory or just handwritten inventories. Uh, you can you can start off doing like just a deployment type thing, and then as time goes on, if you want, you can use it more for configuration, or you know use it just to do some deployment type stuff, uh, and then go back to Puppet for the stuff you already have written in Puppet. Cool. And one thing I did notice when I was looking at the Ansible website is, uh, as far as facts go, it's uh, when you're getting your initial inventory and information about the boxes. If you already have Factor or Chef's Oh, hi, I think it is. Mm -hmm. It'll grab those facts and use them in Ansible yeah. playbooks, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Ansible, I'm, the, the guy who wrote Ansible, Michael Dehan, I think it's Dehan. Hopefully he doesn't kill me for saying his name wrong. Um, he worked for uh, Puppet and Red Hat. Was it Puppet? I, I think it was Puppet. Um, he worked for them for a long time, and he, he was the uh, main guy behind Funk. And he, F-U-N-C, not F-U-N-K, uh, he's not that old, you know. But uh, um, he he saw the problems people were having with infrastructure orchestration. That's the the key word for Ansible is orchestrating your infrastructure, not just managing your configuration. And so that's that's how he developed Ansible. He wanted a tool that could do everything pretty well, if not the best, and do it in a in a little bit more modern way using YAML and uh, uh, Jinja two for the to make it easier for the end users to get it set up and everything. So, any other? All right, thank you. And also, um, I know that there's the uh, closing session coming up, but uh, could everybody here please pick up any trash you see? Uh, since this is the last session, that'll help the uh, organizers get things going a little faster. So, thank you again. <laughs>